thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate your t giving us the time. And I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you about your development as an activist, starting with what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And I think uh, thinking about your roots and where you came from, um, that's, that's an Im important, informative thing. Um, I grew up in a household and in a situation where um, I feel like women were particularly not valued. I also grew up in a situation, um, I don't know, it was, a, it was a really a mixed situation where on the one hand, women were not valued. There was a level of racism that was expressed by my father um, on a consistent basis. And at the same time, there was an emphasis on caring for other people. There was an emphasis, a religious emphasis that I feel like was formative. Uh, my grandfather was a minister. So this, this ideal of being a moral exemplar was something that was um, an important thing in, in my family. Um, but I think as a child, one thing that was evident to me was that there was a disconnect between some of the messages that I was getting, many of the messages that I was getting, that the level of moral concern or social concern functioned for one group, but not for all people. Um, and as a child, I think children are connected with a sense of justice and fairness and it was clear to me that, that there was a certain amount of injustice and lack of fairness uh, early on in life. And so I feel like that was a, a big factor. I think also growing up during the civil rights era and growing up during the Vietnam War protests was an important thing and listening to the, the arguments between my brothers and my father, the quiet comments in the kitchen that my mother had that disagreed with my father, and definitely watching the evening news. Like I can remember quite vividly the image of the child who was running down the road in Vietnam after the napalm attack and her arms are spread and she has no clothes on or the images of the Kent State massacre where the young woman is um, kneeling above the student who's been murdered or I think of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, the Kennedy's assassinations. All of those things were so present in the news. And so being aware of that, I think also was an influence. I think, I, I think another thing for me that was a factor um, was living on a farm in Illinois, but spending a portion of the summers in Louisiana with my grandparents. And I remember playing on the swing set with my cousins and Lori Abel and her family. And they were talking about um, where they were going to school the next year because court ordered uh, integration was going on. And so, you know, these, these young people that um, some of whom I went to church with, who were all of a sudden leaving the public school and going to freedom schools was a big topic of conversation around the neighborhood swing set that I think was formative in my thinking too. I feel like so many of those things you've talked about as disconnects continue to be disconnects today. Unfortunately, I feel like those disconnects do continue. And it's interesting to me how, how subsequent generations have to relearn or learn anew these, these same things. We have, we have our similar moments. And yet, I have to say I am hopeful about a sense of forward motion, there's the opportunity for change and that hopefully we're going in a better direction. Did you did you ever read Rebecca Solnit's book, Hope in the Dark? She talks about these moments where things co coalesce and it, crisis arise that give us the opportunity to change that we would not have otherwise. And oftentimes there's this arc and then a retreat, but you know, hopefully that retreat never takes you back lower than where you were before. So it's two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. But the importance of a crisis in helping people refocus and come together. She talks a lot about that in that book. Speaking of hope, what continues to give you hope or guides you at this point and gives you courage? In part, working with children, that's a hopeful act in and of itself, I think. I'm oftentimes amazed at the sense of I don't know, the sense of fairness, kindness, goodness, the ability to 
to see things in profound and clear ways that happens with children. And especially because you might not expect that. And then when you receive that from a child, that's a pretty, pretty lovely thing. I feel like hope is something that you have to nurture and you know, thinking about what it means to be an activist or to promote justice early on in your life and how that plays out over decades. And, and I think when I was younger, um, the idea of activism or the, was more grounded in confrontation. And as I've gotten older, I've come to the conclusion that the crisis, the confrontation, that's a necessary thing. But I've also come to the conclusion that having personal conversations, helping people learn to be kind, helping people find ways of connecting with themselves in kind ways, and then connect in the world in kind ways, I found that to be much more hopeful and perhaps much more effective in the long run. And oftentimes too, I think when you're young, maybe you don't have those skills. And especially if you're coming from a place where you end up engaged in activism in some way because of an awareness of trauma or an experience of trauma. I think that there, there's an arc of identifying a problem, um, confronting the problem, and then working to resolution. And when I was younger, the idea of working towards resolution, that wasn't part of the equation yet. <laughs> Just being angry about the equation, that seemed to be the important thing. So I think it's in part aging gives me hope. But, but also that contact with the, with the very young, it's good too. As an artist, how or why do you think art speaks to people in ways that maybe other mediums don't? Well, I think, I think one thing about the visual arts, and it's true about music as well, some kinds of music as well, is that um, sometimes when you have complicated issues that involve emotional communication, um, intellectual communication, the fact that, that those can be nonverbal, I think may be important. It allows you to process information in a gestalt, so it's not a linear process. You don't have one word following another, but you're able to think about it or experience the ideas in a more holistic way. That's an important part of it. I also really believe that art is an important function for people and societies to process what's most difficult in life and also to connect with what's most joyful and beautiful in life. So it does these two dual things. So it makes sense to me that art in connection with activism taps in on both the trauma, but then the hope as well, that, that that's an important part of it. And then also, you know, it engages us in our senses. So the idea that you are creating symbols that help warm people's thinking, warm people's experiences, the way that, you know, I'm thinking about, is that Richard Ferry? I'm going to get his name wrong. But the person who did the Obama posters really helped as a catalyst in his campaign. Those images, I feel like, were so iconic. I think that there are many different ways that, that art happens. And certainly, you know, you see in repressive societies a desire to contain art because it does tap into people's um, intellectual, emotional, political, spiritual idea formation. Like when you can bring people with different experiences together and facilitate that that kind of exchange and conversation, whether that's verbal or whether that's the through the creation of an artwork, a garden, a community support of, or response to a crisis. All those things I think are formative in really positive ways. What advice do you have for young people today? I always wonder if I'm you know, qualified to give people advice. I don't know if advice would be the, the word. I might encourage them to listen. I think oftentimes activism is taken as the active portion of the word is the one that carries the most sway. But I think also having perhaps a sense of courage to, to listen, to be gentle and kind, to accept people where they are. I feel like that's a really important thing that perhaps in the heat of the moment, it's um, rather than think about things in binary, think about things in terms of gray, that there, that there are a lot of different 
ways of relating to an idea or a lot of different experiences or belief systems within different cultures and different people, different families, different individuals, building up your own sense of respect for others as you are expecting others to have respect for you. That listening part, I think that that's a, that's a really important thing. If we're only speaking, then I assume that I have a lot to learn, being willing to learn as well as help people learn a new point of view as, as you're facing injustices. The other thing that really strikes me is that if you want to change somebody's mind, shouting at them is not a good way to do it. Um, making them feel belittled or shameful um, is probably not a great way of doing it, but looking for where you have some common ground and can have a, you know, and build empathy. That seems to me like a much better way to do it. Yeah, it's been, it's been a year like no other. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank cool. you so much. Take care.